Welcome everyone. I'm Jennifer Curtis, Dean of the College of Engineering, and I want to thank you all for joining us today for our College of Engineering Distinguished Lecture. Our College Distinguished Lectures feature top, feature top academic and industry experts and also to share and exchange ideas with our faculty and students. Before we begin, I wanted to share a few housekeeping items. The lecture will be recorded and will be shared on the college's YouTube page after the event. Questions can be submitted using the Q&A button and will be discussed during the session. There will be a, some Q&A in the middle of the talk and a, a more comprehensive Q&A at the end of the talk. Joining us today to introduce our guest speaker is Chancellor Gary May, who's an electrical engineer, and he came to UC Davis to lead our university three years ago. Chancellor May is an engaged and highly accomplished leader in higher education. His vision as UC Davis's seventh chancellor is to lead the university to new heights in academic excellence, inclusion, public service, and upward mobility for students from all backgrounds. Chancellor May earned his master's and PhD degrees in electrical engineering and computer science at UC Berkeley. He's won numerous awards for his research in computer-aided manufacturing of integrated circuits, and he is a member of the National Academy of Engineering and the American Ad Academy of Arts and Sciences. Please welcome Chancellor May. I have the privilege of introducing today's guest lecturer, Dr. Sandra K. Johnson. Dr. Johnson is the founder, CEO, and CTO for Global Mobile Finance, Inc., a fintech startup company. She is also the founder and CEO of SKJ Visioneering, LLC, a technology consulting company. Additionally, she is formerly the chief technology officer for IBM Central, East, and West Africa, and was based in Nairobi, Kenya. Finally, she's my friend. Dr. Johnson earned her BS, MS, and PhD degrees, all in electrical engineering, from Southern University, Stanford University, and Rice University, respectively. Dr. Johnson is the first African-American woman to earn a PhD in electrical engineering with a concentration in computer engineering in the United States. She is a member of the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers, IEEE, and the Association for Computing Machinery, ACM. She is also an IEEE fellow and an ACM Distinguished Engineer. Dr. Johnson was a member of the IBM Academy of Technology, which includes the top 1% of IBM's over 250,000 technical professionals. She's received numerous technical and professional awards and is a master inventor with over 40 patents issued and pending. She has also authored and co-authored over 80 publications. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Sandra K. Johnson. Okay, hello everyone. Um, it is certainly a pleasure for me to share some time with you this afternoon for you, evening for me. And I wanna spend just a few minutes uh, giving you an overview of blockchain currency. This includes what is blockchain, how it's implemented and can be leveraged, and some information on cryptocurrencies and my view of this technology moving forward in time. So first, what is blockchain? Well, imagine this issue. Tim uh, is shopping at a store that's owned by Amanda, and he's, he wants to buy these goods, right? Tim does not know Amanda. Uh, so uh, because they don't know each other, they don't really trust each other to, to use certain types of uh, currency. Uh, so typically what happens in that case is there is a third party that becomes that comes becomes a part of this equation, if you will. That third party could be credit cards, or it could be uh, mobile apps, money apps such as PayPal, Square, Stripe, etc. Uh, that's because both Tim and Amanda both trust these third party entities intermediaries uh, and therefore will transact business using these third-party services. 
However, there's some issues associated uh, with uh, leveraging this third party intermediary. Uh, they charge, right? Uh, and the fees are passed on not only to Tim, but also to Amanda. Uh, many of them have banks uh, as back end systems. Uh, and banks, you know, have their own settlement systems that may be slow and inefficient. Uh, these services are open to hacking and fraud. Uh, and of course, the costs of addressing these issues are then passed on to both Tim and Amanda. And, uh, you know, banks, as well as, you know, any service, there are some mistakes that are made and the costs associated with that, again, are, are passed on to uh, Tim and Amanda. Uh, and also the, the processing, you know, when you uh, give your credit card to, let's say when Tim gives Amanda his credit card, you know, he's completely unaware of the back end processing that happens. And typically there are many, there are several intermediaries that's uh, a component of the processing and uh, it's not transparent to the user. And this, many of these solutions are centralized, which means it's prone if the, if the central processing entity goes down, there's an issue. And so a better solution would be blockchain technology because blockchain essentially could be this third party. Uh, and I'll go into details of what I mean by that. But the thir a third party that uh, is less costly, less expensive, more transparent, um, and uh, it, it enables one to actually see the transactions because they are recorded uh, and they are recorded, recorded in such a way that is difficult, is very difficult, not impossible, but very difficult for anyone to tamper with that data. So it's tamper evident, uh, but not tamp tamper uh, resistant. So, so in a, in a shell, you know, at a high level, that what that is what blockchain is. So, how can it be implemented? Well, I will walk you through a high level implementation based upon uh, the Bitcoin blockchain technology. There are many, many different types of blockchain technologies that's available. Uh, the most popular one is the Bitcoin uh, technology. So. Going back to the example of Tim and Amanda, let's say Tim is A and uh, Amanda is B. Uh, so Tim wants to send money to Amanda, right? Uh, and so what happens is Tim will uh, uh, request that funds be sent to Amanda. You know, he will go to a specific uh, a blockchain entity and make that request, okay? And let's say for discussion, purposes that entity is a miner uh, who provides the service of allowing Tim to add this transaction to their what I call a local block right so then this miner will add Tim's transaction to many other transactions and this group of transactions let's say it's 2,000 of them this group of transactions then becomes a block and this block essentially just has thousands of, of transactions. Um, and so the miner then uh, works to get its local block to be part of the whole global chain of blocks, right? Again, where each block is essentially a collection of transactions. Uh, and in a global blockchain, in the case of Bitcoin, is one big global uh, blockchain that's distributed. It's not located in any one location. And so you have essentially miners from around the world that are competing with each other to determine which one of their blocks will be the next block to be included in the blockchain. So how, they go, how do they go about determining that? Uh, well, in the Bitcoin blockchain, they, they need to build a consensus. All of them have to agree which miner is the one that owns the block that will be added to the global block. And so in the Bitcoin blockchain, uh, there's this methodology that's called uh, proof of work. Uh, and, and they use this methodology to determine which miner, you know, has the block that will be added. Uh, it's a cryptographic algorithm. Uh, it's, um, 
it's a highly secure algorithm. Uh, the specific one used by the Bitcoin blockchain is called SHA-256, shared hashing algorithm, as a 256-bit output. That is, uh, the input to this algorithm is the information that's contained in the block, plus uh, some additional information. But the information, the transactions, as well as additional information in the block, uh, it goes through this algorithm, and each miner, you know, it's looking at, at, at a potential output that has a certain number of leading zeros. Let's say it's a 256-bit output. Uh, but let's say the leading zeros are 10. So you have essentially hundreds, if not thousands of miners around the world that are crunching numbers. That is this algorithm that using as input the block information and they're all trying to get an output that has 256 bits with 10 leading zeros. And the first miner to get the 10 minute, 10 leading zeros in this 256 bit output is the winner. I, I, I liken it to rolling the dice, right? Uh, you're trying to get the double six, right? Uh, and the double six in this case, is a 256-bit output with 10 leading zeros. Uh, and the first one to get the double six is the winner, right? Uh, and the winner then will share with the other miners, I won, it will share that data, share its block with the other miners. They will verify, yes, you are the winner. Uh, and then that miner, that winning miner, then places this block on the global block, the global global chain of blocks. And only when this happens will Tim be able to complete the transaction with Amanda. Now in the Bitcoin block, this takes roughly 10 minutes, right? So if you can imagine for a financial transaction, this is not viable because you don't wanna wait 10 minutes for a transaction to complete but it is viable in many other uh, applications. And so that's more or less um, how the blockchain works. I described some of the processes uh, that are included in this list. Um, every node in the system, that is every blockchain node in the system has a copy of the entire ledger. In the case of Bitcoin uh, blockchain, that is every single uh, block in the global uh, Bitcoin, every single node has a copy of that ledger. Uh, in the Bitcoin blockchain, it was originated in January of 2009. Uh, so if you think about it every 10 minutes, since January 2009, a new block was created. Uh, every node in the system has access to all of those blocks since January 2009. And the thing about this ledger that contains the data uh, is that, you know, it's replicated, it's synchronized, et cetera, so that all nodes have access to the same data. So I wanna talk a little bit more about the contents of the block. I mentioned a list of transactions. Uh, one of the, the main um, uh, components of this block I wanna talk about now is what's called a nonce. Right, uh, and a nonce essentially is this random number that the miner uses as input to this cryptographic algorithm. So the, the miner has its own local block with a series of transactions. It has some other information as well. Uh, and what it does is it takes that information, it adds a nonce to it, which is a number that they're just guessing, uh, to try to crunch the numbers to get that 256-bit result with 10 leading zeros. Uh, and they will try over and over again using the same algorithm. The only thing they will change is the nuts. So they'll keep changing the nuts until they can get, uh, until they're the first one to get the result that everyone's looking for, right? So the nuts is essentially the input to this algorithm. Uh, and they'll keep trying, they'll keep trying, they'll keep trying until 
they arrive at a nuts that which will give them the result that they're looking for right uh and so the minor again is part of the process of selecting the next block and what does the minor get out of this why are they called minors because the minor that wins this this roll of the dice gets a prize right uh that prize is 12 and a half bitcoin and that's how bitcoins are created that's the only way bitcoins are created right uh the winning minor is awarded the prize of bitcoin what you see here is an example of the contents of a block right uh you have the block id you have also a block uh, a link to the previous block because these blocks are linked you have the actual nonce that i described uh, you have a timestamp and, of course, the list of transactions. So what I described essentially was blockchain 1.0. The transactions are essentially financial transactions or some other simple type of transaction. And since 2014, uh, it becomes more powerful because transactions can be more complex. For example, it could be a smart contract, right? Uh, for example, uh, uh, if you can imagine contracts as we know them today, right? Contracts as we know them today, legal contract. Uh, essentially, a smart contract uh, is a software version of a legal contract, right? Uh, and so um, the contract is written up uh, as you would do um, in a normal uh, process for agreeing to some legal um, action etc right and once the contract is written up then it is coded into a program right uh, and then the contract that smart contract is then added as an item in the list of transactions in the blockchain uh, and so once that block becomes part of the overall public blockchain uh then it's it has all of the qualities of any other uh type of data that's placed on the blockchain uh you, you know it's, it will be difficult to change the contract uh without the other participants recognizing that someone tried to change uh the particular contract all of the parties involved are it says anonymous is like pseudo -anon anonymous someone really can using sophisticated techniques determine who the party is. For the most part, they're anonymous. Uh, and what happens is some type of external event will then trigger the execution of the contract, right? Uh, and so that contract executes when certain conditions are met. And I'll talk more about that later. But this also enables regulators when it comes to certain industries like the finance industry. Um, they can keep a, a, an eye on contracts as part of their regulatory process, right? Uh, and so uh, what I show you here, here are some examples of how complex or smart contracts uh, can be executed. Uh, I'll use as an, uh, the second item here, um, part of a supply chain uh, management process. So you have a manufacturer who wants to deliver goods, the goods are placed on the truck, the truck goes to the ship, the goods are placed on the ship, uh, and then the ship reaches its destination, the goods are placed off the ship onto another truck, uh, then transports the goods to the buyer. Every point of that process, from placing the goods on the truck, from the truck, truck reaching the port, placing the goods on the port, et cetera, can trigger the execution of a contract. Once that contract is uh, on the blockchain, it is automatically triggered, uh, executed without human interaction. So all of the work is done ahead of time uh, so that any time uh, uh, there's a transfer of goods, it triggers the execution of the contract, timestamps, uh, et cetera, to <coughs> create an electronic record of the process of moving the goods from the manufacturer to the buyer. So blockchains can be public or private. 
uh, public, that is anyone can have access to the data. Uh, uh, the Bitcoin blockchain, for example, is public, right? And then there are private blockchains. You can imagine with finance, with, with healthcare, for example, privacy associated with that. Then there were uh, private uh, blockchains as well. But they all have the same qualities you see uh, list, listed here or there. They're decentralized and the participants who have access to the public, I mean, to the private blockchain, for example, uh, they can share the information, they can maintain the consensus using a certain process, et cetera. What you see here are some examples of blockchain, uh, blockchains that exist. This is a very small example. There are literally uh, hundreds of uh, blockchain examples that exist today. So, so how can they be leveraged? Well, we, what you see here is, is, is a small list of particular fields of endeavor, uh, of, of industries where uh, blockchain uh, can be leveraged and have a significant impact. Because what happens uh, in many instances is that data that previously may have been in silos that are not easily accessed by the relevant parties, uh, blockchain enables this data to be shared across, um, in, the, in the case of the a public blockchain, anyone can get access to the data. In a case of private, those who have access to the data uh, can get access uh, to that data. Uh, so if you can think about that, many industries where, you know, data that may have been siloed and difficult to access, then all, all of a sudden it becomes easily accessible. It can enable blockchain technology to be a game changer and disrupt many issues. I mean, I'm sorry, many industries. And I think it's a technology of the future. So a little bit about cryptocurrencies. As I mentioned with the Bitcoin, which is BTC, uh, a Bitcoin is only created when a miner wins, you know, gets the double six when you roll the dice. Uh, uh, and you see here on the right, the dates initially in 2009, it was 50 Bitcoin uh, and, uh, it, uh, up until um, from 2009 to 2012. And then at 2012, you know, it was cut in half. And then again in uh, 2016. So every four or five years or so, uh, the reward for a miner is cut in half. So as of right now, at least the last time I checked today, it was 12 and a half Bitcoin. Uh, and Ether, which is the second most popular blockchain technology, uh, the Ethereum, uh, it's uh, the uh, reward of the miner is two Ether, right? Now in Bitcoin, in the Bitcoin technology, there's a limit to the number of Bitcoin is 21 million. Uh, and uh, in the Ethereum blockchain, there is no limit. Uh, what you see here is sort of a list, a sample of the types of businesses, the names of businesses that accept Bitcoin now and the URL at the bottom uh, is a, a complete list uh, that's always being updated. Uh, and if you want to look for a business that accepts uh, Bitcoin, the uh, URL at the bottom right uh, points you to those businesses. So moving forward, uh, when it comes to blockchain, as I mentioned, it's a game changer. You know, uh, it can disrupt many industries. It's the technology of the future. However, um, initially, you know, there was a lot of excitement about blockchain technology. Um, and everyone wanted to get on the bandwagon of, you know, I want to get into this technology. I want to understand it. I want to have an offering. I want to have a study. I want to do a study on this. But it's important that we understand the technology and determine, once you understand it, is this a technology that's a good fit for what you want to do? Because not, it's, a not, it's not a good fit for everything and everyone. Um, this particular chart is, is what I call a hype cycle, uh, a hype curve. It's put out by Gardner, uh, and it, it shows the the hype, if you will, of blockchain from its inception to moving forward in time. Now, this particular slide is dated July 2019. 
So essentially the expectations, the excitement early on, you know, uh, enabled the hype to go up very high. Uh, and you see here many data points of different types of businesses that and industries that looked at blockchain, looked at creating prototypes for blockchain, et cetera. But then at some point uh, when these prototypes and early studies, many of them did not pan out. Uh, and then the implementers became disappointment disappointed moving forward in time uh, and then it reached what's called the trough of disillusionment uh, in the sense that it didn't work out so let's go back to what we were doing before uh, and then only then moving forward in time where uh, those prototypes that showed some promise and there's more focus on it we're beginning to see now uh, some substantive solutions uh, related to blockchain, and we will see more as we move forward in time. And this type of curve is typical for new technologies. So that's sort of an overview, very quick overview, overview of blockchain technology and cryptocurrencies. So I want to stop right here uh, and let Dr. I mean, um, um, Dr. Curtis, Dean Curtis, take over uh, and moderate any questions you may have about this. Thank you, Dr. Jatu. Uh, we, we do have a question in uh, the Q&A, and please, if you would like to ask a question, just type that into the Q&A. So you talked a little bit about this, but if you want to expand, the question is, can you speak about the potential utilization of blockchain for purposes outside of economic transactions um, and some of the examples that you mentioned? Um, outside of finance. Yeah, uh, outside of healthcare, uh, then uh, the, I, I did. Let me go back to that. <laughs> you know, uh, here we go. Uh, men, 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 this is just a small sample, uh, but but real estate, for example, uh, for those of you who've ever bought a house, right? Uh, you know, for example, that uh, you want to ensure that the house you buy, that the owner that that is selling the house actually owns the, owns the house so you actually purchase title insurance you know you have this company that does a title search to ensure that the that the seller really does own the house right and you pay a fee for that service but this is public information so if it is on a public blockchain then you can just do the search and it either will not cost thing or the costs are significantly less than what you would pay with title insurance. So as you can imagine, just that particular component of real estate uh, can be a game changer for the title search in industry, right? It could, one can argue, eliminate that industry or minimize it, right? Uh, and you can I think of examples, you know, of many, many fields, some of them shown here, but, but just about any field that requires access to data, uh, that require you to share data. Blockchain technology has the potential to, uh, to be used in that particular industry. Thank you. The next question we have is, do miners need to be trustworthy people? Can miners have bad intentions such as misusing the data? Uh, because blockchain is designed in a way that if anyone tries to uh, modify the data, okay, uh, because of the cryptographic technology, uh, it will be difficult, uh, if not impossible, to do that, right? So even if miners try to do that, they will not be able to do that, right? Uh, and so from that perspective, uh, you trust the technology. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, another question. Very basically, how do Tim and Amanda, from your example, actually obtain the Bitcoins? In uh, the example that I used, mm -hmm. okay, uh, they don't necessarily have to uh, use Bitcoin. They can use any currency. But in terms of how, how does one obtain Bitcoin, uh, there are open markets that you can actually buy and sell Bitcoin. So you can obtain Bitcoin by just buying it in the open market. And this is around the world, not just in the US, but
but around the world. And this will be the last question till we we'll continue with the rest of the talk. Why are people investing in Bitcoin if it has a quantity limit? The quantity limit is 21 million. We have not reached that point yet. So that's a very good question. I think many of them may not realize it, but, but let's think about this. If there is a quantity limit, you know, of 21 million, once you reach that, then imagine what the, uh, and, and if the demand increases, that means your Bitcoin becomes more valuable, right? And right now, most uh, Bitcoin purchases are people who are just investing, right? So they want a higher return on their investment. So, so if there's a limit to the, the actual number of Bitcoins that are going to be out in the open market, then at some point when you reach that limit, uh, you could potentially have a greater return on your investment. Thank you. Uh, I think we'll continue with the rest of the talk, and then we have some more Q. Uh, if you want to submit more question and answer, please do so. Uh, and uh, thank you. Okay. All right. So um, the second part of my talk is I'll give you uh, a sort of um, an overview of my career, my experiences, share with you words of wisdom uh, as you uh, start or, or continue in your own career. So first of all, the early years, uh, uh, you heard Chancellor May uh, sort of, you know, give you a background of, of my experiences. So Southern University, uh, where I uh, earned undergraduate degree, is, is an HBCU. Uh, and that particular university was a very positive environment, very supportive environment. Uh, and at the time that I attended, uh, that were forty percent of the students were female, right? Uh, which is, you know, I'm not sure how many universities even have that now, but uh, for HBCUs, that's not unusual. So, so uh, my tenure there was was a very good one, a very positive, supportive environment. One would ask, uh, what was it that? Uh, encouraged you? How did you determine that you want, wanted to pursue engineering uh, in, in college? Well, uh, when I grew up, um, my family um, was not really aware of the engineering profession, other than those who drive trains, right? Uh, and so uh, when I was in high school, I did get a letter from Southern University Advertising our Engineering Summer Institute for High School Students. Uh, and while I was not interested in really learning how to drive a train, I was very happy with the prospect of getting away from home for the summer so I would not have to wash dishes. So I applied to learn how to drive a train. Uh, was accepted and then spent uh, the summer on campus in a dorm at Southern University. And that's where I learned the other engineering profession was introduced to electrical, chemical, me mechanical, civil engineering, fell in love with electrical, and I just knew at that point this is what I was born to do. And that's why I went on to Southern to uh, get a bachelor's degree in Stanford and Rice University. A couple of uh, my experiences uh, at these universities is, is one, you know, you, you work in problem sets, uh, as a team, um, and the work was designed so that you had to work as a team. That was, it was just not designed to do the work individually. Excuse me. And so at the end of every class, every, uh, at the beginning of every quarter, is when we formed teams. And uh, no one wanted to be on my team, uh, including the women. And so when this first happened, you know, I began to panic. Uh, and then one of the students, foreign from another country, was experiencing the same thing. So we formed our own team. And uh, what I learned as part of that process is most of these students were the smartest in the class, so I was on the best team. Uh, and that's how I was able to go through the process. Uh, uh, another experience is you know, I had already earned a master's degree. I started a PhD program at a different university. Uh, I go into a computer science lab. It's for graduate students. And I sit down and start working. 
and the um, the lab assistant came to me, and I was sitting down, and he was standing over me. So you have this power position, and he says to me, "I believe you're in the wrong place." And so I looked at him, and I said, "No, I'm not." <laughs> and so we went back and forth. You're in the wrong place. No, I'm not. You know, and I was like, "I could have done this because I knew I was in the right place." He was the one that was mistaken. Uh, and so then he started asking me questions. And he that while he was a master's degree student, I was a PhD student with uh, whose advisor was one of the most influential in the department. So he became nervous. Uh, and he apologized to me. And so I, I said to him, that's okay this time. But the next time you see someone who looks like me walk into this lab, don't be so sure of yourself. So I, I use this as an opportunity to educate because he'd never seen someone who looked like me before as a graduate student. At the time, I didn't know I was the first, right? Uh, and so I, I, I considered that and, you know, he just was sure of himself. So this was my way of educating him that, you know what, uh, anyone can come here and just because they uh, are not familiar to you in terms of the type of student uh, that comes into this graduate lab, don't be so sure of yourself in the future. So that was a, I looked at it as an opportunity to educate. So once I graduated and I went on to IBM, starting at the IBM TJ Watson Research Center in Yorktown Heights, New York. Uh, at the time, it probably still is, considered one of the world's premier industrial research organizations. Uh, and even before I uh, started work, during my um, interview visit, um, <clears throat> and the way IBM did it in research is they had a host who would meet you in the lobby, who would put together your schedule prior to your arrival, and then ensure that you went from one interview to the next, right? It's usually one or two days. Uh, and so my host uh, was a female uh, computer science re researcher who in subsequent years became the first IBM female to become an IBM fellow, right? And this is Fran Allen, uh, Fran Allen. She just recently passed uh, a few weeks ago. So, you know, she actually reached out to me as a mentee, even before I started working at IBM, from the day I walked in to interview, right? Uh, and she was very helpful to me throughout my, my career. You know, anytime I, I, I walked into, I ran into issues, you know, I would get together with her for lunch or coffee and we would talk, through, uh, talk things through. Uh, and so she was very helpful to me. Uh, and, and looking back on some of the things she did that she never told me about, but I was able to figure out, uh, I'll give you an example, the IBM Academy of Technology. And you heard Chancellor uh, May mention that uh, it's uh, one of the premier, the premier technology organization within uh, IBM. And existing members elect new members. Uh, and so in order to be elected, the members have to know you exist. They have to know your capabilities. They need to speak favorably on your technical accomplishments and abilities, right? And so um, the Academy had this program uh, where every year, because the Academy would meet uh, when it was about 300 members or less, once a year somewhere in the world at an IBM location. And so every year they would invite high potential employees who are good candidates for future membership to come. They would be sponsored uh, or by someone or have a, a guest, uh, I'm sorry, have an uh, existing member uh, sort of be your host, introduce you to members throughout the meeting, et cetera. And so I was invited to attend one of these uh, meetings uh, before I was a member, right? Of, and and uh, I did not know who invited me. 
uh, the person who hosts me, I had never met before. So, you know, Hill was invited to this meeting and existing members are the ones that recommend members to be invited. And so she never told me, but time, she was the president of the BM Academy of Technology, right? Uh, and so, uh, yes, she was the one to make sure I was invited and she asked someone to host me who did introduce me to others, right? And it turns out that years later when I was actually a candidate, that was the second time I saw the host, right? The first time was at the meeting. And so I remember meeting him at a conference and this was right in the middle of the election for new members. And so he said, Sandra, have we met before? And then I looked at his name and I said, you hosted me, you know? So I, I go through the details of this uh, to, to emphasize the importance of having mentors who are in positions of power and influence who can make things happen for you. Uh, and so Fran was one of my mentors and I had others at, as well, not only within IBM, but external to IBM. So I participated in some uh, professional activities. For example, I was, uh, because of, you know, a friend Allen, uh, she suggested to the Computing Research Association that I be a, a good candidate to be on their board. Now, the Computing Research Association uh, is an organization of the uh, PhD granting institutions for computer science and computer engineering in North America. And so the board essentially consisted of the department chairs of these uh, institutions in North America, plus members from industrial, industrial research labs. So uh, Fran was the one that ensured that I was nominated to be on the board. Again, the members, uh, that is the, uh, the deans of these universities around North America, uh, elect the members. So I was elected and I became actively in, engaged in some of the well-known, very successful researchers in North America. And at the time, I did not realize just how valuable that was. But then when I became a candidate uh, for IEEE Fellow, which is, you know, one of the top organizations for electrical engineers uh, and uh, the highest honor, you know, um, then I needed existing fellows, IEEE Fellows, to write that as a recommendation. And so for me, it was very helpful that I had many recommendations outside of IBM. And this was primarily the researchers that I worked with when I was on the board for the computing research organization. So it is very important that you have mentors because there are some things that may not be obvious to you, uh, uh, but they've been around the block. They understand how things work. Uh, and to have them, they can make things happen for you, even when you are completely unaware, right? Uh, and so after about 12, 13 years in research, then I moved into other parts of IBM. I knew everything about research, or at least quite a bit, maybe not everything. And I wanted to learn about other parts of IBM. So I spent some time in development and sales. And working with mentors was able to do that. And that was a point where I'm interested in focusing on Sub-Saharan Africa. And it was the mentors that I worked with that helped me get an, an assignment, an international assignment. Uh, so I ended up in a cell organization uh, because I was interested in moving to that part of the world and, and spending a lot of time in the Middle East and Africa, primarily Africa. So I was flexible enough to focus on technical sales, uh, uh, leading a team, a technical team in a sales organization that worked on prototypes with enterprise customers. I also did some work in a business development, uh, you know, working with partners to create marketing campaigns or 
special types of offerings that we could bring to market. So I spent time doing that in Dubai, in the United Arab Emirates, and in Nairobi, Kenya. Uh, and then my last IBM assignment was as Chief Technology Officer for IBM Central, East, and West Africa. And so throughout this career, I traveled around the world, uh, had an international assignment, all because I was uh, flexible and open to learning new and different things. Uh, and uh, I was just excited about adventure. I mean, I moved to Dubai, not knowing a single person in the whole country, in the middle of the Arab Spring. But when I left, I had lots of friends from around the world. Uh, and so uh, I would encourage all of you uh, to seek out those types of opportunities because it was living abroad that made me truly appreciate the United States of America and the advantages uh, it brings to its citizens and those who live here, right? And in fact, I was so excited about moving back. It was like, God bless America. I got red, white, and blue everywhere. Um, because uh, especially the countries where I lived, emerging countries that has a number of issues, makes you really appreciate, not only professionally, uh, but just holistically, uh, the advantages of living uh, in the United States of America. Uh, so, so after, uh, you know, my last few years, when I was in Nairobi and I started thinking about what I wanted to do next, you know, I started thinking about my experiences living in Nairobi, traveling around Sub-Saharan Africa and the Middle East, uh, and I used mobile money, which is a little different from mobile banking that we're familiar with because mobile money is not really associated with a bank, but a mobile telephone service. So that those who um, ha to have mobile phones, there are significantly more citizens in emerging countries that have mobile phones versus bank accounts. Most are unbanked. They do not have bank accounts or credit cards, but they have mobile phones. So the mobile phone service providers created this financial instrument that's associated with a mobile telephone number. Uh, so it's interesting to see in a cash-based society uh, like Kenya, where most of the people don't carry cash because they have mobile money, they can uh, send money to family and friends by just typing in their mobile phone number. They can do the same when they purchase good go to services like you know when i went to the coffee shop when i went to the grocery store a restaurant you name it i paid using mobile money and also when i would come home and doing breaks and try to send money back i experienced the pain if you will of the high transfer fees of you know sometimes it takes a while for the recipient to get the money and sometimes uh, the recipient is difficult for them to reach the pickup location. So I put those two together, remittance and mobile money, and uh, came back from uh, Kenya uh, and started my own company, Global Mobile Finance, which has developed GRMIT, which is a remittance uh, mobile app focusing initially on Sub-Saharan Africa. Right. So that, that's more or less... Uh, how I did, and, and by the way, I'm not the type of person that has said, I, you know, has always thought about starting my own company. Uh, I got the idea when I was traveling around Sub-Saharan Africa, understanding uh, and, uh, and seeing an opportunity that, uh, that I could do on my own, uh, not as a part of IBM. And so that's uh, why I started thinking about this. While I was still young, <laughs> I was able to do it. Uh, and so uh, it's been a wonderful experience for me. I learned a com it's a completely different mindset uh, than working in corporate America. Uh, but I've learned a lot. Uh, I, you know, looking back over my IBM career, you know, I did development, I did marketing, I did sales. Uh, and so one would think, oh, you were planning to, to uh, start your own business, so you got your experience 
in these areas through IBM. No, that was not my plan, right? It just happened to work out that way for me, right? Uh, and so uh, it's been a wonderful experience. I have had many challenges, you know, I share with you some of them, but I think I'm gonna stop here. That's it, yeah, I'm gonna stop here uh, and open it up to any questions that you may have. And so with that, I will turn this over back to you, Dean Curtis, for the Q&A. Thank you very much. And yeah, we have some more questions. Uh, again, attendees, please just type in the Q&A. So uh, the next question we have is uh, the Winklevoss twins, who were early Bitcoin inventors, investors, I'm sorry, are predicting Bitcoin to increase to 500,000. How much do you think it can rise in price? I have no idea. <laughs> I have no idea. Um, because right now, Bitcoin is, is, is more or less, to some extent, still based on hype. Uh, it's based on anticipation of value at some point in the future, which I know is what investment is. But there's, there's, it's, it's nothing but that. There's, there's nothing no other substance behind that. I think that once we get to the point where Bitcoin um, has critical mass in terms of being used to buy goods and services, it may be something different. So, you know, to say it's going up to 500,000, I, I, I don't know where that comes from. You know, it could be they're just trying to uh, increase the value of their own, uh, I, I'm guessing, I have no idea. Uh, of their own portfolio of Bitcoin. Uh, I, I have no idea. Thank you. Next question. In the real estate case, given that title search has been used in the past, how would one initiate the process of using blockchain that ties into a title approved by the traditional method? Um, the data uh, that one uses in a title search has to be on the blockchain, right? So uh, in order for this to happen, the data has to be placed on the blockchain. Uh, and uh, I have no doubt that's going to happen. It's not a question of if, but when, how long will it take? Uh, but just like the internet, it didn't just take off overnight. Uh, it's a process and it's gonna take some time to, to get there. It, it, I, 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 I'm sure there will be prototype studies, certain uh, 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 jurisdictions may want to do a study on it to see how it works. And if it works well, then it will span to other jurisdictions, et cetera. Uh, that's how I anticipate for most of the, uh, the processes that we currently have in place now, how they will be implemented in blockchain. The thing about blockchain is that it opens the door for new and innovative and creative ways of doing things that's different from the processes that we have in place now. So, uh, so I'm excited about that prospect as well. Wonderful, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, attendees can now, uh, I don't see any more of the Q&A, but we're gonna go, if you want to do the raised hand in uh, participants, uh, we can take questions um, that way. So these would basically be live questions. Just raise your hand um, in the in the participant section there. Thank you, Dean Curtis. I'm the moderator behind the scenes. I have the power to unmute if anyone uh, raises their hand. I'm taking a look. We'll give it uh, another minute. And the Q&A box is also still available if you would like to utilize that. So I'm not seeing any come through. I think it's getting, oh, here we go. Uh, Colleen, I'm gonna go ahead and unmute you and please introduce yourself and say your department and go ahead. Hi, I'm Colleen Bronner. Um, thank you, Dr. Johnson, again, and it was a pleasure to get to speak with you earlier. I was wondering, could you, for all the graduate students that are on the line, give 
what advice you would give to a graduate student who's starting um, either in grad school or then and then starting in their careers after grad school? Um, well, <laughs> the first thing that comes to mind is hang in there. You may feel like you can't do this. Some of you may feel that way. And I'm here to tell you, yes, you can, right? Uh, I, I strongly encourage you to, to find a support group, a support me mechanism. It does not necessarily have to be someone who's in your field of endeavor, but someone who can provide moral support uh, for you, uh, who can encourage and inspire you and pick you up uh, when things uh, become difficult, because they will, right? Uh, the graduate school process you know, uh, is one that is designed to wean, wean out those who, uh, you know, may not have what it takes, you know, and you can define that uh, many ways. For me, it's in a positive way, right? Because, uh, for example, I'll use this as an example. <clears throat> Simple example. You know, if you want to be a professional singer, then you have to know how to sing. For the most part, right? So that's what I mean when I say may not have what it takes, right? Uh, so that it's something that you have to really want to do and that you have the time uh, uh, to, and focus on doing it. It's grueling, it's difficult, it's hard, but nothing that's worth uh, anything valuable is going to be easy, right? So I would say hang in there, it's, it's going to be longer than what you think. Most of the time it is. Just keep going, hang in there, find a support system. You cannot, uh, you cannot underestimate or uh, overestimate the power of support, right? Even if it's moral support. Uh, because, you know, at the point where you may be down, your support group may be up. And so they can pick you up and vice versa. Right, uh, I have uh, friends who were part of my support group. Some of them is interesting about uh, this pandemic. Uh, some of them I have not seen in decades, right? But we did get together and had a virtual meeting uh, just a couple of weeks ago. It was wonderful. We talked about the good old times, right? And we won't let a few more decades pass before this happens again. But you can get lifelong friends who will be with you and support you throughout your life uh, starting in grad school. So, uh, and the same thing for when you start your career as well, right? Have a great support group. Uh, uh, even if it's just a, a social support group and mentors. And, and the mentors uh, is something I would recommend for graduate students as well. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, I think we have one more question. Uh, question on advice as far as career transitions go. How would you approach, just, could you give any suggestions for approaching those? Uh, one thing that I, uh, that I would say in answer to that question is, it's highly unlikely that you're going to do the same thing you're doing now for the next 40 years. So there will be transitions, you know, it's part of life. Uh, and so what I would say is, you know, know who you are, <laughs> know, uh, what you enjoy doing, what I encourage all people to do is to understand um, um, your purpose, if you will, for lack of a better, what, what your purpose is. Uh, understand, and, and you may not know what that is, but if you don't think about what is it that gets you so excited that you cannot wait to get up every morning to do. Or you have to pull yourself away from it because you'll work yourself to death, right? Uh, this, is, this is your passion, passion. This is probably something you were born to do, right? And for some of you, it may be several things. But if it's at least one thing, then pursue that, right? Because you're going to be the happiest when you do that. And it may not even be what you're doing now. That's okay, right? 
uh, eventually you get there, right? Uh, because I have seen many situations where people uh, find themselves in careers that trapped, they feel trapped because they may have a family, they have obligations, and they can't just walk away or transition easily. Uh, but that's why it's important to pursue your passion, right? Uh, and even your passion may change over time, right? And when that happens, you put a plan in place to transition from one thing to the other. Work with mentors, work with folks who are in this new area. Understand what does it take to success, successfully transition in, in this new area with the experience that you have, right? What I don't suggest is that you just quit without knowing exactly what you're going to do, right? Especially if you have a family and obligations. That would also be, uh, uh, let's just make life a little more complicated than it should, right? So essentially, you're going to have uh, multiple interests. You know, you know, I shared with you, I did a little bit of this, did a little bit of that. Now I'm doing something I had no idea I was going to do even 20 years ago, even 10 years ago, right? Uh, so be open, be flexible, understand what your passion is, pursue that because you're going to be the best at it because you're excited about it. Uh, even if it's being a garbage collector, if you are a passionate garbage collector, you know, the people in the homes or uh, the commercial buildings will know who you are. <laughs> uh, you'll probably be the best paid garbage collector and you may certainly be the happiest because it's all about pursuing your passion, what makes you happy, because that minimizes health issues. Wonderful. On that encouraging word, I think we'll, we'll thank you very much, Dr. Johnson, for your wonderful talk and for sharing with us. Um, it was very motivating, very encouraging. I really appreciate it. Um, before I conclude the program, I just wanted to mention to everyone online that our next distinguished lecture will be November 9th. Uh, Dr. Shafi Goldwasser from UC Berkeley is going to be presenting on safe machine learning. And I just want to thank you all again for attending and thanks again to Dr. Johnson. Thank you, Dan Curtis. Curtis. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Likewise. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.